Hey Life Church, Lydia Long here. I am here today with Pastor Jericho. Jericho, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Excited to be with you guys this morning. So good. Hey, we want you to greet someone in the chat right now. So comment, whoever's above you in the chat, comment and say hello to them. We want to connect with you today. Hey, uh, as we move into a time of worship through song, uh, I know for me, it's kind of hard at home uh, when I just sit on the couch and I'm sitting under a blanket and all that. I know with the colder weather, it kind of is enticing, but man, I wanna encourage you to take this moment to do what we would do if we were meeting together in the building, to stand up and worship. And if that's closing your eyes or raising your hands, but uh, you know, we talk about God's not confined to the walls of the building. And so our prayer as a staff for you right now is that God will encounter you right where you're at, wherever you're watching this, and that you would be uh, moved powerfully in this time of worship. Oh, my 
days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay in my head I will see With the goodness of God
to worship with you guys. We are excited. This is our second week of the This or That series. And Jericho, I thought that we would try a little This or That game. Oh, yes. Thanksgiving edition. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's okay. do this. Okay. Okay, Jericho. Um, this or that, turkey or ham? Oh, ham all the way. I'm, I'm turkey. Gotta oh, say I'm okay. turkey. Okay. Well, that's forgiveness. <laughs> this or that, uh, stuffing or gravy? Ooh, stuffing. I'm gonna stuffing. go stuffing. Yes, me too. Me too. Okay, final one. This or that, watching football games or napping? Oh, nap. Nap. No, oh, I'm surprised. I, and I love my football, but I get in that food coma. The nap is like my lifesaver on Thanksgiving. Agreed. I don't like sports, so napping. <laughs> yeah. But guys, we are going into our second week of the This or That series, and today we're talking about living for myself or giving my life away. So join us as we go and listen to Pastor Dave. Grab your Bible and however you prefer to take notes, let's hear from Pastor Dave. Hey church, today we're continuing in the series we kicked off last week called This or That. Last week, we, we talked about this idea that we've all got these giant choices to make that really set the direction for our life. And last week, we talked about, we have the choice. Am I going to live with a stagnant faith or a growing faith? Today, I want to talk to you about another one of these giant questions that really set the trajectory for our life. Am I going to live for myself or am I going to give my life away? And, and, and see, here's the thing. When, when I live for myself, what happens is I end up not really living at all. I, I, think that I, I'm, I think I'm really living, but I'm really not. Here's what Jesus said in, in Matthew 16. He says, whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me, whoever gives away their life, whoever loses their life for me will find it. Jesus says, if you really want to live, then give your life away. It's really the secret to life. Jesus then goes on and says, what good will it be for someone to gain the whole world? What, what good will it be if someone makes it the goal of their life to live for themselves, to accumulate as much as they can for themselves? He says, what good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? When I live for myself, when I live a selfish kind of life, I end up not really living at all. I love how the New Living Translation says, it says, if you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life, if you give your life away, for my sake, you will save it. John Bunyan, who wrote the great classic uh, Pilgrim's Progress, said it this way. He says, you have not lived until you have done something for someone who can never repay you. See, when I live for myself, I end up not really living at all. Here's the second thing. When I live for myself, I end up not really loving at all. First John chapter 3, verse 16 says this. He says, by this we know love that he laid down his life for us. He, so, so John says, the way we know what really real love looks like is that Jesus gave his life away. He says, by this we know love that he gave his life for us. He gave his life away. He says, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. He says, Jesus gave his life away. And so we, as his followers, we give our lives away for one another. He says, but if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, if anyone has some money, some possessions, some food, some clothing, and then sees someone in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Here's, here's what John is saying here. He's saying talk is cheap, and, and you can say that, that you love someone, 
But if you then go on and live a selfish kind of life where you're living for yourself, he says you're not really loving at all. He says it's really, really selfishness is the greatest enemy to love. And he says the way we know what love is is that Jesus gave his life away. And he says so the way we love one another is that we give our lives away to one another. And he gives us a very practical way to do it through meeting practical kinds of needs. So when it comes to love, talk is cheap. Nothing kills love like selfishness. If you are having any relational problem in your life, maybe with your spouse or with a a coworker, a close friend, maybe one of your kids, 99 times out of 100, every relational problem in your life usually goes down to at least one person, normally two people, being more selfish than they ought to be. Selfishness is the killer of love. And so when I live for myself, I'm not really loving. Edwin Lewis Cole It said the degree of loving is measured by the degree of giving. Selfishness kills relationships. Selflessness, giving my life away, is the the greatest fertilizer for every relationship. John Maxwell says this, that in, in your relationships with people, in every relationship you have, you are either a plus or a minus. You are either living a generous life, adding value to people, or you're selfishly sucking the life out of people. And we all know people like that. We all know people that when we see them in the distance, our our heart jumps up inside because we're excited to see them because we know that they are a person that most of the time brings a net positive to our life. They live this generosity in their loving that that then leads to, to me leaving encouraged, feeling better about life. And then there's other people, we see them in the distance and there's something about us that, that wonders, man, can I hide before they come close? Because usually we, we leave them feeling discouraged because they end up, end up sucking the life out of us. And so in every single relationship, we are either adding value, we're either a net plus, a net gain, or we're or we're sucking the life, we're either a, 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 a net minus in their life, and that's the way it is in every relationship. So when I live for myself, I'm not really loving. Here it is. If you want to end up dying alone or with a lot of regrets, live for yourself. It's the enemy of love. Here's the third thing. When I give my life away, everything in my life begins to change. When I give my life away, everything changes. One thing that'll happen is I will begin to live to serve. In Mark chapter 10 and verse 45, here's what Jesus said in the New Living Translation. He said, for even the Son of Man, see what was happening here with the disciples, is they were in some ways living for themselves, always talking about who's gonna be the greatest, who, who, who's gonna be the most, most important person in the coming kingdom. They always wanted to know who, who was Jesus' favorite, who would be the greatest. And then Jesus says this. He said, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. See, there's this, there's this connection that, that ultimately Jesus uh, on the cross gave his life for us, but even while he was living on earth, uh, Jesus was living to give his life away. Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, I came to serve and to give my life away. There's this connection. See, when we serve, what we're doing is we're giving away our time. And what, our, what time is, is it's simply the name that we give to pieces of our lives. And so literally when I give away my time in service, when I use my, my talents, the abilities that God has given me, and I use time to give those away, what I'm literally doing is I'm giving my life away. And so when I stop living for myself, and I begin to give my life away, then I will begin to have this passion to serve others, to to serve God's mission in the world. I will live to serve because in doing so, I'm practically, tangibly giving my life away. When I give my life away, I will surrender my rights and embrace inconvenience. 
One way we know that, that in some ways we're living for, my, for ourselves is if we're constantly talking about what we think we deserve and we're constantly talking about what we think is fair and we're constantly talking about our rights and our privileges and we're constantly upset when we feel like those rights are somehow hindered or we're somehow inconvenienced or we're regularly overly offended. Well, what happens, what those are is it's signs that in some ways I'm still living for myself. But, but when I am living to give my life away, what happens is I will embrace those moments where, where, where I, I, I'm called to surrender my rights. I will embrace those moments where life gets a little bit inconvenient. Sometimes people ask Claire and I, why would we? When our youngest child at the time was 14 years old, we were only four years away from kind of being home free and living the empty nest life. Sometimes people ask us, why, why would we adopt three little boys? The youngest of which was 18 months old at the time, kind of pressing the, the giant do over button, kind of starting the, the, the timer again to, until that moment of, of, of being empty nesters. Why would we do that? And really, the, the, there's really three reasons. One is we just fundamentally believe that, that God has adopted us, and that adoption is the clearest picture of the gospel that we can live out. The second is this, we believe the Bible clearly teaches us to take care of orphans. In fact, last Sunday was what's called nationally Orphan Sunday, kind of highlighting God's heart for orphans and kids that, that need a home. But really the third reason, probably the biggest, is we just really felt like very tangibly that, that this was the, the, the most significant way that we could choose to give our life away in a 24-7 kind of a way. And, and, and here's the thing, there's moments when a toddler climbs into our bed in the middle of the night and it's like, man, I just wanted to sleep and I didn't want to be disturbed by a two-year-old and, and, it's this, and there's this moment where I'm like, why am I being so inconvenienced? And there's this moment of, 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 of why is this so hard? And, and, and really, what, when I'm thinking clearly, and, and, and what really kind of, it's really just a moment for me to step back and say, in this moment, I'm choosing to give my life away. And so that's what happens when we, when we stop living for ourselves, and, and then we live to give our lives away. We begin to much more easily embrace those moments where it feels like, like our, our, we've given up some rights, we've given up some inconvenience. We've willingly engaged in something difficult. That's what it looks like to give our lives away. When I live to give my life away, I will become radically generous with my money. Here's what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. See, here's the thing about money. See, just like time is, is, is a portion of our life. We just call time, that, that, the way we measure up pieces of our life. For most of us, there's this direct correlation between money and time. Most of us have a job where we take our, our time and the abilities that God has given us, and we, really, we trade those for money. And so you go somewhere, you work, you trade your time and your abilities. That, 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 that time, that, that name we give to pieces of our life, you trade that to them for money. And so again, when we are radically generous with our money, what we're doing again is we're really giving away our life. It's part of what it looks like in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Paul is talking to this church at Corinth about their generosity, and he says, and now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace of, that God has given the Macedonian churches. Paul's talking to this church at Corinth. He says, hey, the church at Philippi, incredibly generous people. He says, in the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. A lie many times we believe is that if I simply had more, I would be more generous. But what we see here, this church that Paul's talking about says, hey, they were incredibly poor, yet they were incredibly generous. And what the data shows in our country is that the more someone has, the less generous they tend to become uh, percentage-wise. And he says, so out of their, their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity, for 
Therefore, I testify, they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. He says, what they were doing, they, they were begging. They were saying, hey, let us give. They really wanted to live generously. It's this part of what it looks like to give your life away. And he says, and they exceeded our expectations. They gave them first of all, to, they gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. And then a, a couple of verses later, Paul challenged them. Paul challenges this church at Corinth. He says, but since you excel in everything, in faith and speech and knowledge and complete earnestness and in the love we've kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of God. Giving. See, when I, when I stop living for myself and then I begin to, to, to give my life away, it really will change everything about my life. I, I'll give my time away in service. I'll, I'll give my rights away and embrace inconvenience and challenge as I'm just giving my life away. And then I become radically generous. And every year at Life Church, we have what's called the Life Church Christmas Offering. And, and so everything that is given between now, November 15th, and December 31st is all a part of our Life Church Christmas offering. And Life Church, like many churches across the country, it's, it's pretty common to see as much as 40% of the annual gifts to Life Church come in the last two months of the year. And, and so we just sort of plan for that. Let me share with you some things that we're going to do by God's grace through this Life Church. Christmas offering. Here's the first thing. And this is everything given. And you don't have to designate this is everything given from now until the end of the year. The first part is it meets our normal budgeted need. And so, so just kind of the normal budgeted need for Life Church for this time of year is $425,000. Allows us just to do all of our normal ministries and operations that allow us to continue to make a difference in Reno and around the world. Here's the second thing we're going to do. And we did this last year as well. The second thing we're going to do is, is we're going to go ahead and fund a significant amount of what we will give to, to meet tangible needs of people in our church and around our city next year. So last year is a part of, of last year's Christmas offering. We were able to give $50,000 towards the, the benevolence needs in our church and in our community that we were able to give away this year. In fact, this year in 2020, we've actually been able to give away a hundred $106,000. I, I imagine before the end of this year, we'll probably end up giving away close to $120,000 to meet tangible needs here in our church and in our community. And, and so this year, what we're going to do is, is this $50,000, um, some of it we're going to spend immediately, like in the next couple of weeks, Washoe County schools, di school districts. And we, our, our commitment at Life Church is we want to be the church that when organizations in the community discover a need, that, that we're among the first that they tell about it because they know that we want to make a difference. And so Washoe County has, has alerted us and some of our partner schools have alerted us that this year, for a number of reasons, they're finding themselves with more children experiencing homelessness and poverty in need of coats than they have in years past. And so what we're going to immediately do over the next week or two is we're going to immediately buy 200 coats to begin to meet some of this need. And then the remainder is going to be available to be given away to people in our church and in our community um, over the next 12 months. Let me share with you two things that we were able to do um, as, as a part of our benevolence giving in the last 12 months. We got, got this note from a family at Life Church. It said this, it said, after I was laid off on March the 15th due to COVID-19, we scrambled to get health insurance through Nevada HealthLink because I needed surgery. Once we got the surgery scheduled, we knew that it was going to cost us the maximum out of pocket for that plan. It was more than we could afford. We prayed about it, shared the need with our life group, and asked them to pray for God to show up. Word got back to Life Church about our need, and we were able to make up the deductible out of the church's generosity. Thank you. Life Church. See, that's the sort of thing that because of your generosity last Christmas, we were able to quickly and immediately meet a need of a family at Life Church in this last 12 months. We also got this great note from the Gorin family. 
It says, last December, our family heard from another Life Church member about a woman in a Las Vegas prison who was incredibly scared because she was about to give birth and had no family for her unborn child. We felt God asking our family to send her a letter offering love, support, and ultimately adoption of her child. We received a call a week later that she was due to have him in two weeks and wanted us to adopt. Isn't this an incredible story? We started the process of adoption and had no idea of the cost involved with lawyers and the adoption agency. The church came to our aid and joined us, joined with us to buy our son's freedom. We had never understood how we were bought with a price until we bought his. He has been one of the biggest gifts that we have ever been given. We are beyond grateful that Life Church could aid our adoption and that our church and all that have tithed have bought our son his freedom. He is thriving and we are always going to be grateful for your support and how you have loved our family so incredibly well. Thank you. Look at the picture of that beautiful baby boy. And so listen, because of your generosity, last Christmas, this is two examples of, of, of many others, and we'll share with you some more over the last next few weeks, where we've just been able to, to quickly meet a tangible need, many in our church and many throughout greater Reno. So out of our end of the year offering, we're gonna meet our normal budget need. We're gonna set aside $50,000 to, to meet benevolence needs in our church and around the community, immediately buying 200 coats for children here in the Washoe County Schools. Here's the third thing we're gonna do. We're gonna set aside $50,000. Now this is if we meet our goal. Set aside $50,000 to establish a micro loan endowment to assist Indian churches, churches in India. Now, many of you will remember a few months ago, we were able to uh, help about 120 Indian pastors um, by providing food for their entire families for a, a few months. And, and that was, and we talked to you then about how India, which normally in the best of times is home to uh, about a third of, of the 1.2 billion of, of the poorest people in the world. And so out of the, out of the 1.2 billion poorest people in the world, kind of the poorest of 12% of people on the planet, about 400 million of them live in India. Now that's in the best of times. And we shared with you how due to coronavirus and lockdowns, many of these churches in India have been unable to meet, which has caused many of these churches and ministries to be in an incredibly challenging situation. And, and, and if that was all, the only challenge is they were facing, that would be enough, but it's actually even more. And that um, if you've been following politics around the world and in the nation of India, there's been a, a real strong um, push towards kind of establishing a, a Hindu state without tolerance for other religions and other faiths and, and a specific oppression towards Christianity. Many of these pastors that we've been able to help are pastors that have literally been beaten simply for preaching the gospel. And so what the nation of India is doing is they've been making it incredible incredibly difficult for Western organizations to partner with churches and orphanages and schools that are Christian. In fact, Compassion International was fully kicked out of being able to help um, do work in India by the government just a few years ago. And it looks like over the coming months, there's going to be an even greater crackdown. So here's what we want to do. So we're going to set up a, uh, a endowment fund that will begin a, a micro loan program for these Indian pastors, churches, and ministries. Because it looks like there's going to be a time soon where it'll be very, very difficult to send money to India. So what we're going to do is, is help some, some of these pastors and churches and ministries. God's given them a vision to start revenue generating businesses that will help the, these pastors and these churches other ministries move towards self-sufficiency where they're not as dependent on monies coming from the West. Some ha have started businesses where they have bought a bunch of, of, of chickens that are laying eggs and they're selling those eggs. Others starting businesses making sandals and things like that, but they, there's upfront expenses related to that. And so our vision is that this $50,000 would, would be able to initially be lo loaned out to a bunch of different pastors, churches, and ministries. And then, as, and then with a program where they 
they would pay it back and then those funds in the future would then be loaned out to other pastors, churches, and ministries so that we could be honestly making a difference there, allowing the, these pastors, churches, and ministries to take steps towards self-sufficiency so that they could continue to make a difference if in fact India shuts down the ability to continue to send resources over there. And so we see this as an incredible kingdom opportunity to make a difference where really the, the money can go so far and make a big, big difference. Here's the last thing we're gonna do with this Life Church Christmas offering, everything given between now and the end of the year. So over the course of wrapping up our construction here uh, on the South Campus, we've you know, it was very, very expensive um, in terms of furnishing and fixtures and equipment and landscaping. And so some of those funds were made up through, through um, designated gifts people had given and others uh, out of just normal cash flow and things that we'd planned for. But in that process, we, we knew that we were going to end up dipping into reserves in order to meet those needs. And, and so we were grateful that we had those reserves in order to um, finish up all of those things. Um, yet at the same time, it's left us uh, with about $100,000 less in reserves than we feel comfortable in uh, going into next year. And so the final thing that'll happen out of this Life Church Christmas offering is $100,000 will go to uh, kind of replenish our reserves because I'm grateful for the work that Pastor Scott and his stewardship team put into just keeping our church in a healthy place financially um, so that we can continue to be good stewards and make the biggest difference. And so, so big picture, this offering is gonna allow us to meet our normal um, budgeted needs for this time of year. It's going to allow us to set aside $50,000 to meet tangible needs in our church and in our city. It's going to allow us to make a big difference in India really for years to come as we set up this um, endowment for micro loans to make a difference with these pastors and ministries. And, and then it's going to allow us to replenish the reserves. And so our goal Goal, which we recognize is aggressive, is that our goal is that we would see $625,000 given to Life Church between now and the end of the year. So I just want to encourage you just to pray. Pray about what God might have you do. Maybe, maybe for you, the end of the year is a time where you're able to kind of get a real sense of, of how God's blessed you personally or in your business through the course of the year. Maybe it's a time for you where you're just kind of, you don't have that clear picture of really how you're doing financially till the end of the year. So it's kind of a time of the year where you do a lot of your giving or maybe you end up receiving a bonus, we would just ask you to pray about making a meaningful gift to Life Church between now and December the 31st. Here's the last thing that happens when I give my life away. When I give my life away, I am living the gospel. When I give my life away, I am living the gospel. Here's the thing. The gospel is rooted in the generosity of God. Without God's incredible generosity, there is no gospel. The most well-known verse that most of us learned first when we started learning verses, for God so loved the world he gave, his only begotten son. See, really the gospel begins with God's incredible generosity. It's rooted in his generosity that God, if you think about all the ways that God has given to me, he's given me life, He's given me literally every good gift that I experience in this life from natural beauty. You, you look at Lake Tahoe, you gotta step back and recognize that is a gift from God. It, from good food, you enjoy a good meal, you step back and say, this is a good gift from God. Loving relationships, good gifts from God. Strength and smarts to be able to earn money. He's given me new life in Jesus. He's given me mercy and peace in Jesus, the forgiveness of sins in Jesus. He's given me the Holy Spirit. He's actually living inside of me. He's given me peace and purpose, and he's given me a wonderful inheritance coming my way beyond any uh, uh, imagination. The gospel is rooted in God's generosity. Without God's generosity, that there is no gospel. And so the, the result of the gospel is that my life is no longer my own. See, in Romans chapter 12, verse one, Paul says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Here's what Paul's saying. Paul's saying, I want, I'm challenging you to give your life away. 
But what he's saying is, he's saying, I'm challenging you to give your life away, but the word that gets overlooked is that word, therefore, at the beginning. And what Paul is saying is he's saying, hey, the thing I'm about to say to you, I'm saying it to you in light of all of this stuff I've already said to you. And so really the essence of Romans 1 through 11 is Paul is just going on over and over and over again about the gospel. It begins with some of these verses that we first learned that we began to follow Jesus. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then Romans 5.8, but God demonstrates his love for us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 8, 1, for there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. And these verses and others all are just, Paul is just hammering from chapters 1 through 11. This is the gospel. This is the gospel. This is the gospel. And then so what Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, I'll read it to you now in the message translation. He says, so here's what I want you to do. God helping you take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Here's what Paul's saying. He says, in light of the gospel, give your life away. In light of the gospel, give your life to God. And, and, and so this, this thing is once I've become a follower of Jesus, Bible tells me my life is not my own. First Corinthians 6, 19 says, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself for God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. So you must honor God with your life. See, here's the thing. But this whole big idea of following Jesus, the whole big idea of the gospel, is that Jesus gave his life away. Can you imagine if Jesus had chosen to live for himself? He never would have left heaven. Never would have come to earth. Never would have been born a, a baby, lived the perfect life we couldn't live, lived, died the death we deserved to die. He never would have done any of that. But Jesus gave his life away. But you see, he, he gave his life for us in a sense, it really is more of a trade. And, and that it's this great ex trade, it's this great exchange, that, and that it really begins with we give him our life. Our life that's messed up with sin and shame and brokenness and all of our fears and the fact that we're separated from God. We give Jesus our life with everything that's wrong about us, and in exchange, he gives us his life, his perfection his peace, his power, his relationship with the Father, and everything that's right about him. It's this great trait. And as epic as it is, it begins with us giving him our lives. But here's what we do. We tend to want to take it back. We, we look at that moment where, whether it was six months ago, a year ago, or 30 years ago, when you first became a follower of Jesus, and you'd say, hey, on this date in 2005, I gave my life to Christ. And, and, but what we tend to do is say, that was something we did then. But, but as much as it's a one-time moment where we make this decision that sets the trajectory of our life, it really is this day-by-day -day thing. It's thousands and thousands of choices where we answer the question, am I going to live for myself? Self, or am I going to live in light of the fact that I, I said I was giving my life to Jesus then? And so now it's choice after choice after thousands of choices to give our lives away. Am I going to give my life away? Am I going to live, give my life away through serving, giving my time and abilities, these chunks of segments of time that are pieces of my life? Am I going to give my life away that way? Am I going to give my life away through surrendering my rights and embracing inconvenience? Am I going to give my life away by embracing radical, sacrificial generosity? Am I living out the reality that I have made a one-time decision to give away my life to Jesus, and now am I living that out with thousands and thousands of choices to give my life away? So what are you going to do? 
Are you going to live for yourself? Which means that you end up not really living at all. Are you gonna live for yourself where you end up ruining every relationship or you end up not really loving at all? Or are you going to give your life away in light of the gospel, in light of God's incredible generosity, giving himself for us in Christ? Are you gonna live out this gospel choice, recognizing that, that, that you've traded your life for the life of Jesus? You've, you've given him your life and he's given you his life and now are you gonna live every single choice of your life in that light, giving your life away? Let me pray for us. So Father, I pray that you'd help us. God, we just confess, I confess, God, our instinct, even though we say we've given you our life, our instinct is to wanna take it back. Even though we've given you our life, our instinct is to go back to living for ourself, our own success, our own ego, our own comfort, our own convenience. And God, we don't don't wanna live like that. God, would you help us by by your Holy Spirit? Would you stir up our hearts to to give our lives away? Whatever that looks like, to to live our life in light of the fact that we've given our life to you, that 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 old us that lived for ourselves doesn't even exist anymore. He's dead now. She's dead now. So God, would you help us to give our life away because that's what it means to truly live and that's what it means to truly love God, would we give our lives away in, in ways that, that change everything about our lives? God, would we, would we give our lives away in ways that reflect the fact that you gave everything for us? God, would you help us? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Man, well, what a great message today from Pastor Dave. You know, as I think about um, giving and kind of what he talked about in the, the, the Christmas giving during this season, we're never more like Jesus when we are generous. And that's really what this Christmas season all is all about. It's celebrating the greatest gift that any of us have ever been given. And so I just want to encourage you and to pray, uh, whether, whether you're single or, or if you're married, pray with your spouse about what maybe God would be calling you to give in this season. Uh, Here at Life Church, there's a number of ways for you to give, and you can find out all of those ways by going to our website, lifechurchreno.com slash give, and you can find out all of that information. Also want to let you guys know, next weekend, the the 22nd, we are going to be taking communion as part of service. And so I want to encourage you or let you guys know that uh, to grab your elements before service, be ready. So whatever that looks like for you and your home and the elements you want to partake in, uh, grab your juice, grab your crackers or your bread and be ready to take communion with us. And we're gonna be having baby dedications. Uh, We're gonna be filming those on Saturday the 21st. So if you want some more information about that or you wanna register to participate, go to lifechurchreno.com and click the events tab. Look for baby dedications and we'll get you all the information uh, to take that next step and declaring that you are gonna raise this child in the way of the Lord and raise them well in the church. And church, we would want to connect with you this week. So you can find us on social medias like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Just search Life Church Reno and connect with us. Say hey, send us a message. We would love to see how you're doing and see what's going on in your life right now. And lastly, church, man, we uh, don't take praying for you guys lightly. Uh, every week we gather together as a staff to pray for you guys, whether that's over Zoom or in person. Uh, we're constantly praying for you. And so if you do have a prayer request, uh, you can text prayer to the number 97000, uh, and we would love to join with you in praying for you or for your loved ones um, this season. Church, we love you. We're praying for you. God bless. Bye, guys. <laughs>